I got to thinking about this <clears throat> subject over the past three weeks or so. <clears throat> Boy, I'm going to feel crazy with that. Hey, this don't work, but y'all don't tell anybody because if I ain't holding it, I just ain't going to feel right. <clears throat> I got to think about this thing. You know, we, have, we have a little series on prayer and what prayer is, what prayer means, <clears throat> the types of prayer. We have, we have really had, you know, I talk about what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God. Plain and simple. It is being able to, to, to communicate, to have, have a time to where you set aside, and trust me, you need to set it aside. We'll set aside times to watch every TV show we want. We set aside times to, <clears throat> to read whatever we want, uh, to go and do whatever we want. So why don't we set aside a time to pray, to talk to God, plain and simple. So <clears throat> prayer is us being able to talk to God. It's the best to communicate. He is the one who created us. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And if we're not communicating with Him, folks, we've got a problem. You should never pick up the phone and there be a busy signal. You should never pick up the phone and there be a power outage where you can't get a hold of them. You should always be, a, be able to get a hold of God because you are in control of your connection with Him. Plain and simple. Just like how if you are the one <clears throat> that can control the power coming to your house. I guarantee you in the biggest storm, you would make sure yours worked. Amen. You know? I ain't going to throw out my stuff in my freezer. I ain't going to interrupt my internet. You know? I ain't going to interrupt my TV. You know? I got the power to keep it. <clears throat> the same way with our prayer life. It is up to us to stay connected to God. And prayer is supposed to be simple. Jesus taught, uh, told the disciples many times. How to pray, they would say, God, you know, Jesus teaches how to pray. Of course, that goes through when he talks about the Lord's Prayer, as we call it. He says, it's simple. It's just talking. Little did they know or realize they were actually praying, as we would call praying, every day when they would get up and say, hey, Jesus, what are we going to do today? You know, that's who we go to. We talk to Jesus. So prayer should be simple. It should be simple. And our thought process should be almost based upon Matthew 7 and 7. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. Did anywhere in those words, did you hear any negative, negativity or a possibility of failure? No. There was nothing of such in there. You know, ask and it shall be opened or given. Seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened. There was nothing that says, I might open it today if I feel like it. There, are some, there was this restaurant over here. I won't go into it. This has been a year ago. Mom would say, everybody talks about how good the food is there. I think I went by that place 20 times. It never was open. The same place, there's another one right up here. I'll tell you, you guys, it's a fast food place that's been up here on the hill uh, for years. And it's got this cool, I think, boy, they're going to have good food. I can't never find them open I, in, in eight years. I think they've been supposedly there. I ain't never found them open. If it ain't open, how are you going how, how to get there? How are you going to keep your business going? Folks, we have got to make sure we have open communication with God. Nothing to close it down. Nothing to stop us. And when we get that prayer life going, if we pray and believe, then that's when everything is going to change in our life. Now, it can change several ways. If you look right here, it either changes the outcome or it will change your outlook. You ever heard that song Garth Brooks has? Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. We think they're unanswered. It ain't they're unanswered. It just isn't the answer we wanted when we wanted it. But we got what God wants for us. If we will pray and believe, it's either going to change the outcome or it's going to change our outlook the way we see it. Plain and simple. Ephesians tells us this, 3 and 20. Believe that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works mightily within us. <clears throat> In other words, when we pray, are we really believing what we're telling Jesus or what we're asking Jesus? And if we are, are we limiting him to what he can do? Are we saying, God, this is my need. You handle it. How many times do we get something together? Oh, we draw an outline, make a plan, send it up to God, say, here you go, all you got to do is do this, and it's settled. I'm the only one guilty. Okay, good. So, 
We try to get it all fixed for God, get it all laid out there. When God just says, hey, pray and believe, don't limit it. I'm, un I'm limitless, I'm un I can whatever. Let me handle it the best way of the situation. We don't know our ways are not, are not God's ways. God's ways are not ours. He is so much wiser, so much greater. So you pray and believe he's exceedingly great. Let him handle the rest. Let him touch you. Let him change you. Let him have the effect, the cause and effect, on the situation in your life. And then you just go through it. Let him take you through the, through the steps. And you just walk in his love and in his grace as he holds you in his hand, as he leads your steps, and as he guides you. <clears throat> There's a story about this young boy. <clears throat> he wanted a hundred dollars. He had to have this hundred dollars. And of course, people, as we all know, you know, he'd ask everybody, and you know, nowadays there's a GoFundMe page for about everything. <clears throat> I, I get to laughing. Sometimes the way people put some of these pages up, I'm like, really? Really? You know? If I go out there and sell a donut, sell a cookie, sell something, you know, you, you can do this if you try. But this little boy, he really wanted a hundred bucks. And he got down and he prayed. And boy, he prayed. He prayed. He just prayed, God, I need a hundred bucks. I need this money. Anybody ever been let down by somebody? People would tell him, you know, hey, we can get you this money. Nobody ever got the money. So he just kept praying, God, I need this money. So finally one day he thought, you know what? This always works at Christmas, writing letters. So I'm just going to go write a letter to God. So you guys need to write a letter to God. Dear God, I need a hundred bucks. If you would please send it to me, I would be grateful. Thank you. Signs of six in the mailbox, sends it on. The mailman comes by and picks up the letter. Huh. God, USA. Where do I take this letter? So he finally takes it up, delivers it through the... <coughs> through the right chain of command as other letters are sent, you know, that we know about, and it gets up there, and somebody sends it to the president. Most powerful man in the U.S. Said, Let's just send it to the president. The president reads it and gets a really good kick out of it. He's oh, that's pretty cute, you know. I'll tell you what to do. Had the secretary says, send this young man five bucks. Five bucks ought to help satisfy the need. This ought to be a, <clears throat> let him know that, hey, you know, things are getting done. Things are taking steps. Sends him five bucks. The boy goes to the mailbox one day, opens up. There is his letter. He opens it up, five dollars. He's like, five dollars. This never writes another letter. Dear God, thank you for sending me my money. I really appreciate this. But next time, don't send it through Washington, D.C. They took out ninety-five dollars in taxes. <laughs> you know, man is gonna let us down. Man is gonna take what man wants to take. Man's gonna mess things up. Trust in God. Trust in your prayers. Trust and believe in what God has got for you. If you go to 2 Kings in, in chapter 19, Hezekiah is surrounded. It's, it's going to be there's nation after nation coming after him. The Amorites, and all the motherites, they're all out there and they're trying to come get him. One, they're going to put a whooping on him. And he knows it. And he starts praying to God. God, you have got to help us. We're outnumbered. We're outmanned. We're out. Bow and arrow is out good. We're out bow and arrow and sword. They've got everything on us. We are going to fall. But for your love of your people and for your love and your respect of David, would you please save our people? The Bible says, when you're reading through it, it says that, that the, God answered and said, yes, I will save you. I will, I will sit down. You won't even have to raise a sword. Through the night, the Bible says the spirit come down and slew 185,000 of the Amorite soldiers. And the king wakes up, sees what I got, you know, what all went on. They pull out and they leave. And God had answered Hezekiah's prayer. Go to the next chapter, chapter 20. It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order. For thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, 
Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, I will heal thee on the third day, thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. When we get down to business with God, and we can go to God boldly, folks, you better expect answers. Hezekiah, just imagine what Hezekiah would have been one of those, one of those kings. One of the ones that didn't really follow what God wanted. One of the ones that got the position because it was just next in line, not because his heart was steady and right. He had just prayed and God had just delivered and killed 185,000 of the soldiers. And next thing you know, <clears throat> he's delivered a death message. That would be quite a scare if you ask me. You know, I know, I, I know God just saved. I know God just saved us from being taken over. But I've got news for you: you're going to die. You are stricken with something, and God has put it out there, and you're not going to live. Hezekiah knows within his heart, within his mind, that he his prayers can and will be answered. Why? Because he has trusted. In God time and time again. He has walked in the truth. He has walked in his goodness. And as we look at it. Going this way. Just a couple of verses ago in the last chapter. He just delivered the country. And just set them free without being able to even have to raise a sword. Hezekiah had faith. And he believed in his prayers. He said, God, will you please just spare my life? Will you please, Father? I just don't feel like dying today. I just don't feel like having to get there. There's so much more that I've got to do. There's so much more that I want to do. Wouldn't that be our prayer? Lord, I just, I just don't want to die right now, God. I've got family. I've got friends. And I've got so much to do. I just want to stay here, Father. The Bible says that before the prophet even got out into the middle courtyard... God had already heard his prayers. Now that's the kind of prayer life I want. To where I don't have to wait and sit there in suspense. Where I don't have to wonder, Lord, are you going to answer this one? Or God, am I going to know right away? God, I know you're there. I know you just delivered. And God, I got something else. I hate to be asking so much of you. But God, this is what's on my plate. God, can you just help me get it clean? You ever come up with them kind of things in your life? It seems like there's one thing after another. You go through one battle, boom, all of a sudden, you've got another one thrown at you. You get through one situation, right into the next storm. Just kind of like these folks that's going on all these cruises right now, going through there. You come out of one hurricane, next thing you know, you're going into another one. When we get to that point in our life where it's nothing but storms, it's time to just start enjoying the rain. That's all I can tell you. Get out there. And as a kid, remember how you'd run through the rain? We used to go down to my grandmother's house every time that it would rain and be out there because the water would form like a little, a little river going through a ditch. And we would just play and play and play in that water. Nowadays, it gets raining like I'll be going to the car later on thinking, God, the dude, I'm going to be soaking wet. You know? As a kid, we didn't care. In your life, when the storms hit, was that old song? Singing in the rain. Go out there and have fun. Go out there and know that God has got your back. The storm might be raging, but when you got the master of the ship, you know all he's got to do is say, peace, be still. Now, the storm might still be raging. The storm can be going on around you. The outcome might not change. This still might be in a storm, but your outlook can change and you can have the peace that God can give you that can pass all understanding. The peace can be inside you, and that's what matters. That's when you know you've got the master. When the peace comes, even though the situation hasn't changed, the outcome is still the same, but your outlook has changed. Now, Hezekiah, he got blessed. Says so he turned around to him and says, God has heard your prayers. And he is adding 15 more years. We don't know how God works. It's not us up to us to, to figure it out. Just trust God in everything that you do. Your outlook and your outcome. 
or your outcome and your outlook. There was a man in Acts chapter 10. A certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feareth God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision of him about the night thou were the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with a Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtst to do. And when the angel spake unto Cornelius, <clears throat> he was departed. And he called his two household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. The Bible says it was a devout man of the Italian I was going to say tribe, the Italian man. He wasn't of the Jewish faith and belief. He wasn't one of the original Hebrews, but it says he was of the Italian. He was one of the ones that was, as the Jews would say, unclean, common, a dog. He was an outsider. But there was something about him. On the outside, he might have been different. He might have been born of a different house, born of a different family, born of a different race. But he had something that tugged upon his heart and he believed in the creator above. And the Bible says that he was devout and he prayed constantly. He prayed constantly for something to happen in his life. You know what he wanted? He wanted to know more about God. He wanted to know more about the one who, was cre who created him. He had heard probably, the Bible doesn't say, but somehow he had, he had heard something about the gospel. He had probably heard something about Jesus, and he was curious. He was all, what in the world? I need to know more. I need to know more. And the Bible says as he prayed, it says God heard and answered his prayers. He does it. He says, he says, Cornelius, I want you to do this. Send some men over to Joppa. There's a man there named Peter staying at the, he's at the lake house or the ocean house over here at the sea house. He's staying with another guy named Simon the Terry. He says, I want you to go and get him. I prepared him for you. Isn't that neat how God does that? In his prayer life, not even as, as we would say one of the chosen ones, but he's in his prayer life with God. Not even totally understanding it, but having the right heart, the right, the right desire. And God not only talks to him, but he talks to those who he needs to get with. He talks and sets up the path, lays out the plan exactly as it need be. And it says, on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now think about this. Bible doesn't say why Peter went up there to pray. Bible just said Peter went up to pray. You ever had something happen in your life? You ever been going through a situation? Maybe you got something going on. Maybe it's just been a long time. Maybe you just feel a burden. You just feel something that's just it's just heavy on you, and you just gotta pray. Usually, when you look through the you know you're reading through the scriptures, if somebody says they're there to pray, it gives you a reason. They owe him this heavy burden because it says he went to pray. But this just says Peter went to pray. You ever felt God tugging at you? Hey, just talk with me. We've got to have a chat. We got to talk. I, need to, I need to tell you something. You know, prayer, we said earlier, is talking to God. It's communicating. You know, there's another part to that, and it's called listening. It's called being <clears throat> sensitive to the Spirit to hear what God says to us. But it says, Peter went up to pray. And he became very hungry. And would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now that's praying pretty hard. You pray so hard, you get hungry, you do doing something. Maybe he was a pacer. Maybe Peter walking around talking about, oh Lord, I need your help right now. I don't know, but Peter got hungry. You know? How'd you get how come you so hungry? I've been praying. Anybody ever got hungry praying? You know, I don't, you know, I ain't never got I guess I just ain't never prayed that hard. But it says he got hungry. Now, when you hungry, 
It's also hard to concentrate. It's also hard to keep your mind focused because especially it says while they were down preparing, if he was on the rooftop and they're down there preparing, guess where that smell's coming up? So Peter's sitting there, mmm, boy, them beans and cornbread, show sure smells good. Somebody that cooked the rabbit. And he said, he probably smelled all his food. And it says he's still keeping his mind focused on praying. He was hungry and he was tempted, but he didn't give in. Folks, when we pray, there's going to be times you're going to sit there and you're going to start praying. And the next thing you know, somebody's going to knock on the door. Your phone's going to ring. Your alarm's going to go off. Something's going to happen. A picture's going to fall off the wall. Something's going to happen. Or, if you wait to that last moment, I'll just get in, get in bed and say my prayers. Dear God, you know, something is going to steal our prayer time if we ain't careful. Peter didn't let the food, he didn't let the hunger, he didn't let anything get in the way of his prayer life. And because of this, God was able to move. It says he saw heaven open up and a certain vessel descending upon him. It had been a great sheet and hit at the four corners and, and let down to earth where were all manners of the four-footed beasts of the fields and the earth and the wild beasts, creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again, saying the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou un or call thou not common. This was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Then Peter went down to the men which were there, said unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he who you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And then, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So Peter said, I'm the man that you are looking for. Peter was up on the roof, and of course we all know it, <clears throat> the blanket was spread, and it was, it was set down, and it was all matters of the unclean, and Peter is sitting there looking and saying, no, God, I'm not going to kill us, ain't it? You have taught me from the beginning of from my life. You've taught our people, do not touch, do not, you know, don't do this. And God kept saying, what I have called and created, don't you dare call unclean. Don't call it common. How dare you think? Now, of course, we know this scripture has nothing to do with the fact that, okay, Lord, you, you, you can go scare out your snake and your lizard now, Peter, and eat it up. It's all to do with his relationship with what was about to happen. His being able to carry that gospel out. His being able to share that gospel with what was about to happen in his life. When you get serious in your prayer and you let the temptations of this world go and you stay where you're supposed to in God, God can use you in ways in which you never would have thought of. God can use you. You ever get in that, that you ever seen, uh, going back to the sports the athletes, boy, somebody just having a day, boy, they having a time, and the sports match will say, oh, they're in their zone. You can't nothing. They're going to catch everything. They're going to they gonna be able to, they're in their zone. Some, you know, some baseball hitter, he can hit a ball a mile high. It doesn't matter. He's in his zone. You're never going to be able to get to him. He's in his game. Folks, when we get in our prayer life and we get in our zone and we get tuned in to God, there is nothing in this world that's going to be able to stop us, to hinder us. If we will not only talk to God, but if we will listen and we will hear what he says and we will take those words and we will say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm available. Peter finally said, God, I realize what you're trying to say. I hear your voice. I hear you telling me you've got something different. You've got something new. You want me to do it. Now, Peter never would have went on top of that house to pray. How would he be able to hear and know what God wanted? Folks, prayer can change our life. It can change the outcome or it can change the outlook. We read through here now where it says, Peter opened up his mouth. And he said, of the truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. While Peter yet spake this word, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they were of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Folks, if Peter never had listened, not only went into his prayer ceiling or the prayer roof to get to praying, if he would not have let God change his outlook 
the way that he looked at life, the way that he had been taught and brought up, then he never would have went. Cornelius' outcome never would have been changed, but Peter got the change. He got the outlook. He saw that God was for everybody, and the Bible says that as he taught and as he preached, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit fell on each and every one that was there, and their outcome was changed, and Peter's outlook, yes, I see now, God, you are for everybody. As the prophet Joel said, as, you, as I said on the day of Pentecost, not only for you, but for your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren's grandchildren, he trusted in God, he believed, his, he let his the prayer life change his outlook, so that it can change the outcome for others. Are we able to do that with our lives? Are we able to let God change our outlook on things so that somebody else's outcome can be touched? There was a little boy. <clears throat> Got in the Boy Scouts. Boy, we used to do this here at, at, our, at uh, all of our boys' club events. He's in the Boy Scouts. It's time to make a pine wood derby car. He said, whoo, everybody tells him, okay, you and your dad go home and work on this. You got two weeks. Two weeks to work on this. The little boy gets sad and he goes home. He's like, Mama, I got to make a pine with a dirty car. He didn't have a daddy. Just his mama. So every day for two weeks, boy, his mom gets, okay, it says here we do this, we do this. Boy, she's looking it all up. And they make this car. They don't have all the right tools. <laughs> Man, they ain't, got, they ain't got the right stuff. This car, it's a shambles. It, it's not even. It's odd. It's cut wrong. It's, it's a total, total mess. Don't look good, but it worked. He gets to the race. Man, whew, wins this one. Whew, wins the next one. I mean, that car's just getting it down the track. Finally, he's watching. And this other car is just Tearing everybody all in pieces. And it comes down between him and that other car in the final. Boy, that other car was polished. Brand new paint. We had some guys like that. We had guys in our Pinewood Derby that would take their cars to the car dealership and get them painted. On a Pinewood Derby car that you buy for $3, you go spend 50 bucks at the auto shop just to get a paint job. And I'm not exaggerating. These guys, were, we had one guy that we used to go to church here, he spent 80 hours on the car. Make it thin as a razor, you know, and pour tungsten on that to give it the weight. But this poor boy, here he is, making it to the finals. So it's his car, and it don't only look good, and here's, here's the other one. And he says, can we have a moment of prayer? Everybody just looks at him, and goes, okay. So he steps aside for a minute and a half. He just keeps his eyes shut and squeezed real tight. They put the cars up there and drop the gate. One old first car takes off down. It's just got ahead. And the further they got down the track, the more he was caught up. And finally, at the end, it was a photo finish. But his old car pulls it out. Wins as it crosses the track. Goes across. It's wobbling like crazy. But he wins. Everybody's in disbelief. They're like, wow, wow, wow. And the scoutmaster says, wow, well, I guess prayer really works. He said, what'd you do? Pray that your car would win? The boy says, no, I prayed that I wouldn't cry when I lost. <laughs> he wasn't worried about trying to change the outcome, but his outlook. He knew he gave it his best, but he looked out there and he could see something that he knew was far better that was going to beat him. So he prayed for his outlook in the situation. He was, a, he was in a situation where he thought it was certain defeat. But when God's on the scene, he can change it. One more. As you come to the piano. In Matthew chapter 26, see a man that God loves. I see a man that God has got a plan for. But as all of us, men and women, sometimes we want to do what God's got for us, but the plan ain't exactly what we want to go through. But we know the outcome is going to be awesome. So we have to pray that God will change our outlook. It says, Then come with Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. And he said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. 
and took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou be done. Verse 41 says, he, he goes back and he tells them to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation because the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. 42 says, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except that I drink it, thy will be done. Jesus knows he's fixing to go to that cross. He knows they're 53. Don't do here. He says, hey guys, get ready. The ones that's coming to get me, they're on their way. They're, they're about here. I'm fixing to receive that kiss and, and all things to start rolling. He knew he was fixing to be taken into captivity. He knew he was fixing to be <coughs> beaten beyond recognition. He knew he was fixing to have to go to that cross with that crown of thorns. He knew he was going to be pierced to the side, the nails driven through his hands and his feet. He knew all this. And he goes to God, his Father, and says, I understand what's got to be done. But if you could let this past cut from we can accept 